Okay, here we go. This morning, we're back in Sunday school. It's been, a, I guess, a couple weeks for me. Um, my mom fell and broke her hip, and then my aunt went and died. And don't you wish people would, would just schedule these things for you instead of being so inconsiderate, you know? No, these things happen. I mean, I don't know anyone that schedules breaking their hip, and uh, nobody knows on their calendar the day they're going to die. So these things happen. And sometimes we just have to roll with it. So we've been gone for two weeks. It's good to be back. Um, last time that I was here, we looked at the seven deadly sins. And I can't tell you how much I didn't want to do that because I was like, oh, they're going to think I'm Catholic because that's a Catholic teaching. But I think it went over pretty good. I mean, there was a lot of Bible-based stuff in it. And so we can keep the good, but do be careful. I think I did well to prove how that really leads to people thinking that it's a works-based gospel, and it's not. It's salvation by faith alone. So I was going to teach today on, or actually two weeks ago, or a week ago, whatever. The next week from last time, I was going to teach on the seven abominations in the book of Proverbs. And, you know, might as well just pull it straight from the Bible instead of like what they do. They just grab seven different ones of whatever and put them into one. But I think I'll put that on hold. Maybe we'll do that another time. But there are seven things that God says is an abomination. And those aren't the only seven. There's a lot of other ones. Just like those weren't the only seven sins. There's a lot of sins, you know. But today I thought we'd talk about this subject because yesterday was what? Christmas. Did you say Christmas? Okay. That was Christmas. And do you know that Christmas comes from Christ Mass? That's where the actual word comes from. So made me think about the Mass. And I said, you know what I need to do? I need to talk about the Roman Catholic Mass and why I don't celebrate it. Because I've had some people ask me, Brother Breaker, are you, are you a Romanist? Are you, are you a Roman Catholic? And I go, no. <gasps> why not? They're Christians too. And I said, well, let, let, me, um, let me show you why. And uh, let me go to the Bible and just show you because I'm a Bible believer. Amen. So if they say one thing and the Bible says another, who do I follow? Well, if you're a, a Romanist, if you're a Catholic, they tell you to follow the church. Because they say, this is what they say, there's no salvation outside of Holy Mother Church. So if the Bible says one thing and the church says another, if you're a good Romanist, you would follow the church over the Bible. Do you realize that hurts me to think of that? Because that goes against my conscience. The Bible says that this book is from God and that this is the way to be saved. And that without this book, without what's written here, we can't know how to be saved. Let's see, I dropped my marker here. So I want to follow the Bible. And I believe that the Bible says what it means and means what it says. And the Bible says that it's of no private interpretation. So we always go to the scriptures. So people ask me, can you go to the Mass? Well, let me tell you why I can't. OK, I'm not going to attack it. I'm not going to put down their beliefs. I'm going to do my best to tell you what they believe. And then I'm going to say, now, this is why I don't. OK, so in the spirit of meekness and humbleness and and niceness, I'm not coming out attacking. I'm just going to say, look, this is what they say. This is what the Bible says. This is why I go this route. OK, and it was just thinking about yesterday being Christmas. I thought about, well, you know, it comes from the Mass, so let's just, let's talk about the Mass today and why I am not a Roman Catholic and why I don't go to Mass. So, a lot of things to get into. First thing, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.21. I might have used this verse last time we were here together too. But here's what it says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. The Bible says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. And then the next verse says, abstain from all appearance of evil. If something appears to be evil, then I need to stay away from that. Mm-hmm. And I'm supposed to prove all things and see if they're good or not. So when I look at, uh, at this thing, I'm going to say, okay, is this, is this right or not? Now, Christ Mass, that's what the word Christmas comes from. So Christmas is really Christ Mass. And so it has to do with Catholicism. Do you know that when America was founded, none of them celebrated Christmas? I find that so amazing that so many people claim to be Christians and they don't know the history of our country and the beliefs of Christians. They all just accept Christmas. As a missionary in Honduras, there was some folks that came and visited one time, this other missionary, and I went over and visited with them. And and they said, you don't celebrate Christmas? I go, no, not really. And they said, well, that's un-American. I said, how is that? I said, do you know the history of America? 
Do you realize it was like 1842? Alabama was the first state to vote. It's okay to celebrate Christmas. Do you remember it was 19... I forget the date. No, 1870. June 26th, 1870. The federal government. Yeah, that was so long ago you remember it. The federal government voted to put Christmas into the calendar of recognized religions. 1870. So... It wasn't mandated to celebrate Christmas till 1870. And in America, true Christians didn't celebrate it. It was 1842 that Alabama said, well, yeah, we'll allow that. So why? Well, because a lot of Puritans came to America. The early pilgrims were Puritans. And who were the Puritans? Those were those who were anti-Catholic. Now, why were they anti-Catholic? Because they said, well, the Catholic Church teaches tradition, but we believe the Bible. And you know what? They were persecuted by that religion because that religion says, no, no, you have to do what we say. (laughs) Um, If someone tells you do what I say and you can't do what the Bible says, what are you supposed to do according to the Bible? Follow the Bible. Bible. Remember that? They took Peter and put him in jail and they told him, do not speak in the name of Jesus Christ. And he says, we must obey God rather than man. You cannot make me go against my own conscience And that's why it's ingrained in us and in our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence that we have a freedom of religion, freedom to worship and freedom to follow our conscience. Now, this thing called the mass, I don't know if you know history, but you know, there was a time in history in which that church said, if you don't keep the mass, you will be arrested Mm -hmm. and persecuted and even burned at the stake. So do we still have conscience? Do we have freedom to choose to do that? If you want to go do the Mass, you help yourself. But it should be a choice. Do you realize for hundreds of years it wasn't a choice? So I thank God that I have freedom today to stand up today and and say, this is why I don't celebrate that. Because if I was here 600 years ago, I'd be scared to death that as soon as I'm done with this, they'd have put me in jail for speaking against this. So I want you to remember that in context. It's very interesting. So the mass is taught in Roman Catholicism as something they must do. It is a ritual. It's actually something that they teach. And I've seen this many times in Honduras that it has to do with the forgiveness of your sins. Um, Did I tell you this story? I've, I've got so little time and so much to get into. I don't even know if we'll get it all today. But when I was in Honduras, my neighbor, he said he was Catholic before he became a Christian. Did you catch that? He was a Catholic before he became a Christian. (laughs) And what did he mean? He means I got saved through Jesus Christ, through reading the Bible and trusting in the blood of Christ. That's why I'm a Christian. But before I was in a religion, I was in this religious cult. And that's what he said. Those are his words. And he said, "Um, I'll never forget the greatest day of my life and the worst day of my life. I said, well, tell me about it, Don Julio. That was his name, Julio. He says, I was 13 years old and I was about to be con- confirmed. Is that what they call it? The conf- uh, or there's a name for it when they do the, the confirmation service or whatever. Confirmed. Yeah, being confirmed. And he says, I was 13. They dressed me in my nicest clothes. I've never had such nice clothes. And he said, I, I went to the mass and they did all this stuff. And afterwards, we all leave the church and we're standing out front. And everyone's shaking my hand, saying, oh, I'm so glad you got confirmed. And he's just smiling and beaming. He's just so happy. And then once everybody goes by, he's standing next to his mom and dad. His best friend is across the street and he picks up a rock about that big and just throws it as hard as he can. And it hits him right here in the stomach. And he's just happy and up. And he's just sitting there going, oh, and he walks across the street. Why did you do that, man? And he says, I'll just go to mass and they'll forgive me for it. So what does it matter? And then he realized (laughs) that's that's what they teach, that I can go do whatever sin I want. And if I just go to the mass and have it forgiven, then it's okay." So he said, I'm going to rethink this. And eventually over the years he did. and, And that's how he got out of Catholicism, because it's almost like teaching. It's okay to sin. But if you come to the mass, we'll forgive you of that sin. And so what do people think in their mind? Well, in that case. I just might go do this, this and this. As long as I go to the mass, then it's forgiven. That's that's how many people think in Honduras and Central America and other countries. So the teaching of the mass is it is a teaching of the sacrifice. So we as Christians, we believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and we believe in the blood. We believe in a forgiveness through blood. So we teach forgiveness through the one sacrifice of the blood of Jesus. I'm going to misspell through here. So we have forgiveness through the blood, through the blood of Jesus. Well, do you know what the mass is? 
I have a lot of books. I didn't bring them all, but I have a lot of books. And at home, I have a book about Catholicism, and, and uh, it's a catechism. And it actually says this in the catechism, but I won't go to that catechism of theirs. Instead, I'll go to one of their official documents. It's called the Council of Trent from 1545 to 1563. And in that Council of Trent, you know what they say that the Mass is? They say that the Mass, which is giving a little wafer and, and using a little cup, they say that the Mass is a sacrifice of Jesus. Again. But here's what they call it. They call it an unbloody sacrifice. So they say it's a sacrificing of Jesus again in an unbloody manner. So they call it their unbloody sacrifice. You're leaving out the blood, but yet you're trying to come back and say, but it's this. Isn't that denying the blood? I mean, that, that sounds bad to me. But the Council of Trent says that same Jesus who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is present and offered in an unbloody manner in the mass. That's what they teach. So they teach it as an unbloody sacrifice that they are doing over and over. And they claim that they are sacrificing Jesus over and over. Does that sound right to you? No. So they're literally saying, now, Jesus, we're going to put you up here on the cross again. Jesus, we're going to kill you over and over. That sounds horrible. Who was it that put Jesus up on the cross in the first place? The priests. <laughs> and yet here we have a religion of priests that say, no, we're killing him again. And again, only this time it's not through the blood. It's, it's representative. It's symbolic. Well, they teach what they call transubstantiation, in which they teach that literally Jesus is in that wafer and Jesus is in that cup. Do you know that's what they teach? That's what they believe? Do you know they call people heretics over the centuries in the Middle Ages who said otherwise and burned them at the stake? Do you know that? This is the heart of their doctrine. It's kind of sad. So is that what the Bible teaches? Well, they believe that when that guy takes that and goes, humana, 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 or whatever he does and holds it up and prays, they literally believe, ask any Catholic priest, that they are pulling Jesus out of heaven and putting him into that bread and into that wine. Is that what the Bible teaches? And that they are doing another sacrifice. So how many sacrifices are needed? Is it the one sacrifice of Jesus? Or is it the sacrifices that they do that saves us, that forgives us? Well, let's go to the Bible. Let's go first to Hebrews chapter 10. Because like I said, I am a Bible believer and I have to go by what the Bible says. I can't go against my conscience. So when a church stands up and says that they are the only true religion and that you have to come to them for forgiveness, I say, well, then I can't be a part of that. Right. Because that goes against my conscience and it goes against what the Bible teaches me. All right, look what it says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse. Were you going to say something, brother? Did you want to interject something? I saw you. Okay. Hebrews, feel free to jump in if you have something. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 through 12. Hebrews chapter 10. It says here in Hebrews 10, 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Watch this. Once for all. And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. What? So these sacrifices can't take away sins, but this one sacrifice can and does. Verse 12, but this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So he's sitting down and he did it once. Matter of fact, he said it is finished. How do they think they can pull him down from heaven? That doesn't make sense to me, does it you? Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. Again, the Bible says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So one time. One time. But yet, the Mass is over and over. While well, you have the morning Mass and the evening Mass, even in middle Mass. and There's all these Masses. And what's interesting is, in the old days... You could partake of the cup. Now they don't let you. Only the priest gets to drink out of the cup. Hmm, isn't that interesting? <laughs> they used to go to the Mass. Many people remember they'd give you this little cookie, and then they'd bring the same cup, and everyone would drink out of it. Well, now with COVID, they don't let you drink after one another, do they? So is that something that we as Christians can accept? To me, that's like spitting in the face of Jesus and saying, I don't accept what you did. I'm going to do it over. 
I'm going to sacrifice you because I don't accept your sacrifice for me. It's like backwards. So that's one of the reasons why I cannot accept the mass. I view it as unbiblical and against the Bible and against what it teaches. And it's almost like they're the Pharisees of old, the priests killing Jesus all over again. Mm -hmm. And I look at that, and I just go, no, thank you. No, thank you. Now, am I going to attack and name call and put down and ridicule and talk bad? No, I'm just telling you, this is what they teach. This is what the Bible teaches. That's why I choose this rather than that. And basically what it all boils down to is that this is the Bible doctrine. And like I said, I'm going to follow the Bible. That's tradition. Now, where does their tradition come from? Why is Christmas Christ Mass? Where does the Mass come from? Well, when we look at Christmas, we find something very interesting. And by the way, let me just say this quickly. What does it have to do with eating and drinking? It all has to do with you have to eat and you have to drink. In other words, take something in you. Hmm. Take something inside of you. They want to get something in you. Hmm. If you'll remember our teaching a while back about the... Uh, the uh, snake bite, you remember about wanting to get something in you. Why do they want you to take that in side of you? What is that all about? Well, do you realize that there's a lot of paganism involved in Christmas? I printed something up here today and uh, brought it here just to read it. And I got this off the Internet regarding the date of Christmas. Is December 25th even the right date? No, no most commentators agree. I'm reading here. That from many points of view, no date could be more unlikely to be that of Christ's birth. There's no month in the year in which respectable ecclesiastical authorities have, no, have not confidentially, confidentially, con oh boy, big words. See, see, this must be good because it's big words, right? It says confidently place the birth of Jesus. The date is undeniably pagan. Hmm. Did you know that was the feast of Saturn, December 25th? It's a pagan date, and it was the Pope that set the date of December 25th, and he took it from a date of paganism. I believe Jesus was born in September. But he continues here, the date is undeniably pagan. Even Catholic authorities admit that. The Encyclopedia Britannica, 1849, an article of Christmas says, Clement of Alexandria, who lived about 200 A.D., mentions several speculations on the date of Christ's birth and condemns, condemns them as superstitious. The exact day and year of Christ's birth had never been satisfactorily settled. When the fathers of the early church decided upon a date to celebrate the event, they wisely chose the day of the winter solstice. That was in 340 A.D., which is firmly fixed in the minds of the people and which was their most important festival. So the most important of all pagan festivals was the winter solstice, December 25th. And that's the day that this church through tradition chose to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So they're mixing paganism with a true biblical event, the birth of Christ. Is it good to mix paganism with Christianity? I don't think so. The Encyclopedia Americana 1946 says Christmas or the mass of Christ. That's where it comes from. Christ mass. In the fifth century, the Western church ordered it to be celebrated forever on the day of the old Roman feast of the birth of soul or the sun, the sun God. Among the German and Celtic tribes, the winter solstice is considered an important point of the year, and they held their chief festival of Yule to commemorate the returning of the burning wheel, the sun. Yule logs? Yeah, does that sound... Well, that's not Christian, but that's Christmas. Christmas. It all comes from paganism. The Everyman's Encyclopedia says, Christmas, the Mass of Christ. It is certain that the time now fixed could not be by any possibility, have been the period of Jesus' birth. The choice of this season was probably due to the general recognition that the winter solstice was the turning point of the year. And on and on and on. I could continue. Let me just read a couple more. Alfred Hotties, H-O-T-T-E-S. The roots of Christmas observance go deeply into the folklore of the Druids, Scandinavians, Egyptians, and Romans. The Chambers Encyclopedia, many of the beliefs and usages of the old Germans and also of the Romans relating to this period passed over from heathenism to Christianity. From Rome to Christianity. That's why they love to, we're a Roman Catholic church. Rome was the center of paganism. So when you begin to study, you know what you find is that there's a lot of paganism mixed in with this. That's why a lot of people worship their tree. It's the Tammuz tree. Did you know that? It's found in Jeremiah chapter... Help me here. 10, I believe it is. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 10. 
the pagans cut down a tree, put it in their house, decorated it, and worshipped it. And all over America and the world yesterday, people that claim to be Christians did the same thing. What were they doing? Paganism. Without even knowing it. Sad, isn't it? Uh, here's another one. R.J. Campbell in the story of Christmas says, There are not a few popular observances associated with the Christmas season which have nothing to do with the Christian religion and the birth of Christ. Most of these observances are older than Christianity, and some of them, it must be confessed, are not even very elevated in origin. Oh, I, I don't have time to read the rest, but it's all paganism, heathen. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics. Most of the Christian customs related to Christmas now prevailing in Europe or recorded from former times are heathen customs which have been absorbed or tolerated by the church. The Christian feast that has inherited these customs from two sources, Roman and Teutonic paganism. I, I, I can't go on. I've got, I've got to continue. But do you see what's happening? Paganism, false teaching, mixed in with what they call Christianity. And we're supposed to all just go along with it. Are we all going to go along with the Mass too? Well, I don't go to Mass on Christmas, do you? You say, well, I don't do that, but, but I do other things. Well, watch out what you do. Make sure what you're doing is, is true Christian and not paganism. So what does the Bible say? Well, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and verse 19. If you study paganism, you know what you find out? Paganism is all about worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars. And the stars, well, are angels. So it's really fallen angel worship if you look at it. So paganism here, huh? So paganism is all about worshiping the sun. Mostly the sun, because it's the brightest of all the stars. What does God say about that? Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 19, He warned His people, the Jews, not to do that. Deuteronomy 4, 19, And lest thou... Lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided into all nations of the whole heaven. God says, I don't want you to go worshiping them. Well, have you ever studied history? In history, there was what's called Babylon. And if you study archaeology, which I love archaeology, uh, just about every archaeologist tells you the truth that all idol worship comes from Babylon. So from Babylon comes all idol worship. And why is that? Well, if you have a Bible, you know why. Nimrod is in the Bible. He's the one that went over to the land of Shinar. And he built the Tower of Babel, or the people built the Tower of Babel. And it has to do with Babylon. Babel, which by the way, Babel means gate of God. Hmm. They were trying to build their own little stargate or something, I don't know, to try to get up to heaven. So idol worship comes from Babylon. And do you know that Babylon used to worship um, the sun? They used to have this religion. As a matter of fact, you could still go to Peru and see the ancient Peruvians. They would worship a sun and they would bake cakes and they would worship their sun god by eating cakes that they, hmm, that's interesting. Almost sounds like a little, they were actually little round wafers because the round represented the sun. And so that's how they worship the sun with their little round wafers. You go to the Catholic Church on Mass and look what they do. They call this thing the Eucharist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And before they bless the Eucharist, they put it in a little thing here, which is a little holder, and look exactly what it's shaped like. Mm -hmm. Does that show up on the camera? Go to any Catholic church, say, yeah. where do you hold the Eucharist? And tell me if it doesn't look like a sun. That's right. Is that an accident? Mm -hmm. Or is that actual paganism? Thank right there. I'll let you pass this around and look at it. So when you look into all this stuff, you start to connect the dots. You start to go, wow, this is kind of creepy. And you start to see some things that make you scratch your head. Catholicism, as well as paganism, were all about getting something in you. In the pagan religion, it was a sex fest. There were a lot of orgies in which they would implant something into someone. Okay, I don't want to be gross or whatever, but that's what they, it's all about getting something, partaking of something, you know? And so you look at that and you go, that's, that's interesting. Well, well, they wanted you to partake of a certain food. Do you know why? A lot of times they slipped a Mickey in it. <laughs> a lot of times it was something, and I'm drawing a blank on the word, uh, that you take that makes you go high or whatever. A, um, there's a word for that. They, they would make you take something. What well, do you remember what it's called? Aphrodisiac. No, aphrodisiac something completely different. But when you take it, 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 it had effects that, that, that messed with your mind and made you see things. Hallucinogenics. So they would make you take hallucinogenics in Oklahoma and out in Arizona, even the Indians to this day. That's something they do. They build a big pit and they go down and they smoke.
peyote and things like this. And it's all about getting into the spirit world. So when you look at these ancient religions, it's all about getting you to take something that then takes you on a trip to where something visits you and talks to you. And matter of fact, maybe even gets in you like a demon. So when I look at all this, I go, man, that's scary. So what did the ancient pagans do? Well, the ancient pagans, what they loved to do was get together in secret places. Go somewhere where there was nobody else. Get on these hallucinogenics. That's the word I was looking for. These drugs and then have communion with other spirits. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 15. And guess what they like to do? They like to do this in a secret place. A place where you weren't allowed to come in. If you ever go to a Catholic church, they have a little place over on the side where the sacrosanct or whatever is. And that's the priest place. You're not allowed to go in there. One time I walked into a Catholic church in Honduras and the door was open. And I just walked in and they had a little altar there and I went, I left the gospel track and I walked out. <laughs> so who knows? Maybe he found it. Uh, but anyway, <coughs> it's all about these secret place. There's all these secret societies in the world. Have you ever heard of them? But what does this say? Deuteronomy 27 and verse 15. The Bible says, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image in abomination unto the Lord. Now, by the way, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no graven image. You go to a Roman church, it's full of idols. They say, oh, no, 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 those are images. Make no image. What are you doing with that? That ties you back to Babylon. Idol worship. I don't worship idols. I worship the Lord. And so it continues there. And it says, the abomination, an abomination of the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. You know, um, all throughout the Middle Ages, there was Catholic priests that would go around and do masses in homes and in, in castles and things like that. And they carry a little box. And then they open the box and there's the little worship. It's like it was in a secret box. All this secret. What's with all the secret stuff? It's kind of creepy, isn't it? So that ties us back to the ancient mystery religions. Have you ever heard of the Aleutian mysteries? In all the secret religions of the pagans, they had what they called their mysteries. And they were called the Elysium or Elysian mysteries. So you look into all that stuff and you see all these mysteries and they're meeting in secret and they're, they're doing these secret religious things. So it's all about mysteries. Well, you know what that makes me think about is Revelation chapter 17. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17. And you know what the uh, Roman Catholic religion is? Well, they say it's Holy Mother Church. Well, that'd be a woman, right? And they say, you've got to come to us and there's no salvation outside of us and we'll do the mass and all this stuff. And you, and you just look at that and you just kind of scratch your head and go, hmm, I don't know how much of this that I can be a part of, you know. And look what it says here, Revelation chapter 17. And it calls her a great whore in verse 1. Hmm. And what did she do? Verse 2, she committed fornication with the inhabitants of the earth, made drunk with the wine of her fornication. She was in blasphemy, verse 3. But what is she called down there in verse 5? And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So she's a mystery religion that has something to do with Babylon. And she's fornicating and doing evil things with the things of this earth. Verse 9, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Mm -hmm. So this religious woman is on seven hills or seven mountains. Well, there's only one place in the world that in those times was called the city of seven hills. And that's Rome. Yeah. <laughs> so it's tying all this into Rome and you kind of go, hmm. You go, oh, no, no, that's just circumstantial. Mm, OK. All right. <clears throat> Look at verse 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. There's only one city in the whole world that claims to have rule over the whole earth. And that's Rome, where sits the pope. And the pope kind of runs things behind the scenes, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. For many years, that has been a papal state, which has joined the state and the church together, which is interesting because in the time of Rome before Christ, it was the same way. The pagan church was with the state. And so it hasn't changed much over the years. So she reigns over kings. So it's a church state religion. Go to Revelation 18, verse 3, 4 and 5. Here's what the Bible says. If you if you want to be a Christian, 
For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Mm-hmm. Hmm, she likes to do plagues, doesn't she? Makes people sick. Hmm, interesting. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity. So the Bible says, Come out of her. So if this is who her is, then you don't need to be in that. So that's another reason why I don't want to follow the mass, because I view that as all tying back to the pagan religion. And I'm like, I think that might not be what I as a Christian should have anything to do with. Amen. So I look at all this. Now, there's a lot of good books that you can get into with all this history and everything. The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. If you've never read this, boy, read the two Babylons because he ties it all in and he shows you how that paganism mixes in. David Daniels wrote Babylon religion. And this guy wrote Babylon mystery religion. But then he he undid what he wrote and made another book and said I was wrong. And people wonder about that. But this one basically mirrors the two Babylons. And it goes and it shows you just how much that that church has in common with paganism. And how it just goes against the Bible so much in so many ways. It's kind, of, it's kind of sad. If you get a chance and you want to learn more about it, this is a book by O.C. Lambert, Catholicism Against Itself. O.C. Lambert. And he shows how one pope says one thing, another pope comes along and says the opposite. Does the Bible do that? No. So Catholicism has lots of problems if you'll read it. I've got a lot of things here I'd love to show you. Uh, this is the Confession of Faith from 15... 60 by Cassiodoro de Reina. And I love reading the old Spaniard Protestants. And boy, he's pretty cool. And he goes through here and says, we renounce Catholicism and the Mass. And these things, we view them as as unscriptural, unholy. Uh, This is a book from 1588 by Cipriano de Valera. And he literally calls the Pope a pimp. He was the Peter Ruckman of his day. This book, man, he he says some harsh stuff. He says the Pope is not the successor of Christ. He's the successor of Judas. And so he was very much so throughout history. You have a lot of people that were true Christians that said, but we're not Catholics and we don't accept that. So is being a Catholic being a Christian? Well, in our eyes, we say, no, we're Christians because of what the Bible says. They say we're Christians because of what our tradition says. So they take their tradition all the way back, actually, to Babylon in a lot of their practices. So that's kind of creepy. Now, there is within Roman Catholicism a thing called the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a Jesuit, nor do I wish to be. And I talk about this today because, well, we just had Christmas, (laughs) Christ Mass. But also, I'm seeing things every day going on. And it seems like the news wants to talk about this. And they always talk about the Pope. And yet the news media tells you they're against God and the Bible and Christianity. So why do they worship the Pope? I mean, that's a good question, isn't it? (laughs) But they they talk about that guy and everything like that. And so there's a thing called the Jesuits. And the Jesuits were started by Ignatius of Loyola, a Spaniard. And by the way, uh, Pope comes from Pontiff Maximus, which was the official title of of the Roman emperor. So it it is Rome. That's why they call themselves Roman Catholic Church. It is pagan Rome mixed with Christianity. That that cannot be denied. And so the Jesuits, what is the history of the Jesuits? Well, they call themselves the Society of Jesus and they are the military order of the Catholic Church. And so we just read that whoever this whore is, the mystery Babylon, she likes to kill people. Her cup isn't wine, it's blood. So you look at the Jesuits, okay, and you, you come across some interesting things. I'm going to read something from the Internet here, and it says, Dr. Alberto Rivera, a man that escaped from the Jesuit order in 1967, describes the Jesuit oath in exactly the same way as what I'm about to read. The Jesuit oath of induction is also recorded in the congressional record of the U.S. Congress. And uh, it, it, here's, here's how a person becomes a Jesuit. Okay, let's say you're a Roman Catholic and you want to become a Jesuit. What do you do? Well, it's through an initiation in secret. Hmm, that's interesting. And you come together in this initiation through secret. And uh, here comes the superior. And they begin to, this is the scene, okay? Get this in your mind. You're in a secret place. And when a Jesuit of the minor rake is to be elevated to command, he is conducted into the chapel of the covenant of the order, where only three others are present. 
The principal or superior stands in front of the altar, and on either side stands a monk, one of whom holds a yellow banner and white, yellow and white banner, and the other a black banner with a dagger and a red cross above a skull and crossbones. <laughs> Does this sound like skull and bones type of, oh, now you're in conspiracy theory. No, I'm just reading what they do. Nice. Connect the dots if you want to. With the word I-N-R-I, and below them, these words. Now, you know what these words are? These are Latin words. Now, I don't know Latin too well, but I can recognize these words. Hustum necar regis impius. Basically, it's saying it is just to necar, make dead, kings who are impious, who don't obey the Pope. Mm -hmm. The Jesuits say, we think it's okay to get rid of them and kill them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think that Jesuits killed Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm as well as many other presidents. And you can get books about that and read that for yourself. So they come in there and the superior says, my son, oh, by the way, he grabs a hold of the dagger. My son, here unto you have been taught to act as the dissembler, whatever that means, among Roman Catholics, to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy, even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man. And it goes on and it tells you how they're, their goal is to spy out those within this type of Christianity and try to get them to come back over to them. And if they can't, take them out. You say, no, no, no. Okay, let me just read the Jesuit oath to you. Okay, just so you'll know what the Jesuit oath is. I don't have time to read the entire thing, but part of the Jesuit oath, and it's very lengthy, but if you just type in the Jesuit oath, you'll find this. As a Jesuit, if you swear to become a Jesuit, this is part of your oath. I do now renounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince, or state named Protestants or liberals or obedience to any of the laws, magistrates, or officers. So you literally are saying, I'm not going to obey the law. So you're literally saying the law doesn't apply to me. Well, shouldn't you be in jail? <laughs> That's what they swear. I do further declare that the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots, and others of the name Protestants or liberals to be damnable, and they themselves damned who will not forsake the same. So if you believe in the one sacrifice of Jesus, you're damned to hell. But if you come over here and believe theirs, then they'll, they'll take you to heaven, they say. Well, that's interesting. I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place, they call the Holiness the, the Pope, wherever they shall be in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, on and on and on. Um, I, this one's weird. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own. So I'm basically a slave to the Pope. That's what they claim. Or any mental reservation whatsoever, even as a corpse or cadaver, but will unhesitantly obey each and every command that I receive from the superiors in the militia. Hmm or the Pope of Jesus Christ. So they say the Pope is Jesus. They, a little farther down, now listen to this. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity to present, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth. Now, this is awful what I'm about to read, but this is their oath. Are you ready for this? And that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition. And that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and burn alive these infamous heretics. Rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls. In order to annihilate forever their execrable race. And when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup. The strangulating cord, the steel of the poignard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. And it goes on and on. Does that sound Christian to you? I will murder anybody who doesn't follow our teaching. That's what that says. That is not Christian. So I'm not a Jesuit. But did you know there's some folks out there that are Jesuits? Mm -hmm. Somebody sent me something the other day. Do you know Fauci went to a Jesuit school? Do you know Trump went to Jesuit schools? Yeah. You know a lot of people in Washington, D.C. in positions of authority and power? Mm -hmm. They're Jesuits yes, sir. or Jesuit trained. Is that scary or what? You know, um, The Pope, is he, is he a man of God, is he? 
Is he a real Christian? Well, this guy in 1588, Valera, says we believe that the Pope's the Antichrist. And many Protestants have believed that the Pope is, in fact, the Antichrist. Now, I don't know. I wonder if he's not the false prophet and the Antichrist is somebody else. But there is a hat that the Pope wears. Well, he actually has five different hats, but this is one of them. And it says, Vicarius Fili D, which means in place of God. That's basically what he's saying. That's why they call him the vicar of Christ. He's saying, I'm here on the earth in place of Christ. Okay, well, let's sacrifice you. Well, that no, he doesn't like that. So he does. But anyway, it, it says, Vicarius Fili D. Well, if you take that in Latin, you know how Roman numerals are? It comes up to 666. I'll pass that around for you to see it. There's the hat right there. Some people on the Internet goes, no, he doesn't have that hat. He has like five or six hats. This is the one he has that does say that. And it does come up to 666. Remember the Bible on the forehead, the blasphemy? Wow. So that's interesting. So you look at all this and you kind of wonder. Now, you know there's a thing called the Black Pope. Yep. So the Jesuits, they have their leader. And so you have the Black Pope, which is the leader of the Jesuits. And then you have the White Pope, which is the regular Pope. And so the black pope is the head of the Jesuits. Now, supposedly in Catholic doctrine and teaching and, and in their rules, the black pope can never become the white pope. But some people say that this current pope was the black pope before. I don't know. It's hard to find out. You don't just go up to him and go, excuse me, were you the black pope? And he goes, yes, I was. I mean, it's hard to find this stuff, but you've got to wonder about all this. And, you know, Hollywood makes some weird movies. And I don't like to talk about movies because I don't want you to watch them. But there's a movie with this guy named Heath Ledger that he made before he died. And I don't remember, was it called Sin Eater or something like that? And he was a Catholic priest and he went into the Black Pope. And he asked the Black Pope something. And the Black Pope was into witchcraft and magic and evil. And they were seeking an answer. And the Black Pope says, well, the only way to answer that is we've got to kill somebody. And as they're dying, the demon will enter into them and tell you the answer. And so they killed the guy. <laughs> and then the guy, rah, 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 like a demon, it was like, oh. Is Hollywood telling truth or is this all fiction? Is this all made up? You got to wonder sometimes. I mean, they, they're, they're secret, but they like to get out their, their stuff sometimes. You got to, oh, you got to wonder about all this stuff. It's just, it's horrible. So you got the Black Pope. Matter of fact, let me just say this. In Catholicism, there was a man named Father Malachi, who back in the, I want to say it was the 1500s. It might have been 1300s. I forget. There's so much to study. It's hard to get the, the, the right date and everything. But this Father Malachi said he had a vision and a prophecy. And he sat down and he wrote down the prophecy. And he said, this is what he said. This is a Catholic priest that the last pope will be the Antichrist. <laughs> so even people within their own denomination believe that the pope is going And you know what's crazy? People have looked at his prophecy, and he named most of the Pope. He told you how many. And if you take that prophecy, the one that is now is the last one from the ones he said. And he said it's going to be Peter the Roman. And this guy here, he's Italian. <laughs> so it's weird, isn't it? It's weird. You look at all this, and you kind of go, mm hmm. So should we follow this? Are, are we Roman Catholics, or are we Christians? I'm a Christian. And I don't look at Catholicism as Christianity, especially with all the things that the Pope is coming out and saying and doing. I talk to people that are Catholic all the time and they say, well, I'm Catholic, but we don't accept this Pope because, man, everything he's doing is against what we believe. And it's like, well, handwriting on the wall. I mean, have you read the Bible yet? No. OK, well, why don't you? You know, um, it's time to get in the Bible yeah. and realize that what's happening is, is scary. So what is happening? Well, the Bible speaks about the Antichrist and the blasphemy and all this stuff. And I don't have time to get into it. Let me just give you an example. The Pope says, look, call me Holy Father. The Pope wants you to call him Holy Father. All right, let me just give you an example of why I can't follow Catholicism. The Pope says, call me Holy Father. So all the Catholics go to the Pope and say, oh, Holy Father, Holy Father. Well, go to your Bible to um, John chapter 17 and verse 11. According to the Bible, who is the Holy Father? It's God. God the Father. And in John 17, 11, Jesus Christ is praying to God the Father. He says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Was Jesus Christ praying to the Pope? So why is the Pope trying to steal the title that belongs to God the Father? That's kind of creepy, isn't it? Um, doesn't that sound like blasphemy? 
What if I stood up here today and I said, I am God the Father. You'd be like, Colt, get out, right? <laughs> what do you got, a Branch Davidian thing out here or something? No. Um, but let's go over to uh, Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 9. Jesus Christ speaking, look what he says. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Is the Pope in heaven? Then I can't call him Holy Father. That's against my conscience to do that. Did you know that? But look at the next verse. A lot of people will read that, but they won't read the rest. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Yep. There's a thing out there called Catholicism. And in Catholicism, the Jesuits, guess what they call the, the Jesuits that are head Jesuits? They call them the masters. There's another thing out there called masonry. Yep. And when you get into there, you get all these different levels and degrees. And what are you trying to get to be? The grand master. So you can say, call me grand master. Mm -hmm. Bible says, call no man on earth your father, right. call no man your master. Why do they always meet in secret, those groups? Mm -hmm. You've got to wonder about all that. Is there something to all that? So many presidents, when they become president, they go and they visit the Pope. And they bow down to the man and they worship him. Wonder why? Why is that? Did you know Falsey went to a Jesuit school? Did you know Bill Gates went to that same Regis High School, Jesuit school? Do you know what the Pope's doing now? Pope's pushing something real big. What's he pushing? He's pushing passports, COVID passports. Why would this guy tell you you need to get a passport? What, what is that all about? Why is, he, why is he interested in health? Isn't he supposed to just stick with, the, with what he's supposed to be, which is supposed to be what? Like religion? And by the way, you know I don't respect that man too much. He claims, though, that he has the power to forgive sins on earth. If the Pope wants me to respect him, then tomorrow he needs to go to the whole world and say, I officially absolve everyone of sin. There is no more sin. All are saved and going to heaven. <laughs> now, I know he doesn't have the power to do that, but I'd be like, wow. I mean, but you know why he can't do that? Because then they wouldn't have the mass anymore. Because when you come to the mass, that's when you pay. <laughs> and then there goes all the income. You see how this works? Religion is a racket, folks. Yep. That's why I don't say we're religious. I say we're saved. Yeah. For many, many years, they had what they called the high mass and the low mass mm -hmm. over in Europe. And what they did, the priest said, now, if your so-and-so dies, you have to have a mass for them and you have to pay for it. And you say, why do I need a mass? Well, we do the mass to get their soul out of purgatory. That's what they say. So that's what their belief is. So it's all tied to high mass, high money, low mass, low money. That's a saying that they had over in Scotland and other places. So why is the Pope into all this? What is all this? When you begin to look at the Bible, you say, no, it's Christ alone, faith alone, I'm saved through Him. I don't need men, many of which are sinners, many of which belong to secret societies. I don't need them. I need Jesus alone. So the Pope says he has mandated the Green Pass for the indoor activities such as dining at restaurants and other things. The Italian government also said last week that all public and private sector workers must have the digital V passport by mid-October. Why is this man, the Pope, mandating that people take a certain thing by ch -ch injection into them? Why is that? Why is he saying you can't eat in a restaurant unless you have that? Do you know what that is? That's called the quantum digital tattoo, or at least that's what it's leading to. Right now they call it the digital what passport. I won't say the word. Bill Gates is the one that proposed this, the guy that went to a Jesuit school. Are any dots connecting in your mind right now? <laughs> it's not what I'm saying, it's what I'm not saying in the hopes that something might start turning up here. This is a quantum digital tattoo. This is the new vaccine that they propose for COVID. And it's something that you take and you put it, guess where? Right here, in your right hand. And as you put it here, it actually puts inside of you what they call the inoculation. And so here are some pictures of what it is. It's called a quantum digital tattoo, and it actually leaves a tattoo on your right hand. And that way you know if you have been vaccinated or not. And if you took the thingy. <laughs> so we'll call it the thingy. So what does the Bible say? Well, let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 13. What I'm trying to do is, is say the Bible warns us about the last days and the Antichrist, 
Because the Antichrist's goal is to bring about a mark. And in Revelation chapter 13, look what it says. Revelation chapter 13. And we'll go ahead and read, starting there in verse... Well, let me read verse 4 and 5 real quick. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Who can fight against him? Because he's warring against everyone else, and he's everywhere. And he's making war against everybody else. So he's so powerful, and he's all over. Who can fight him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things, and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty-two months. And he blasphemed against God and his name and all this stuff. And what did he do? He made war with the saints. Verse 7. Well, that sounds like the woman who was drunken with the blood of the saints. And now it says here in... Uh, Oh, let's look at verse uh, 11 through 18. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Interesting enough, you know there's two popes right now. <laughs> that is so weird. That's never happened to two, because that one stepped down. Never have they stepped down, they always die. So one stepped down, and now they're talking that this one might be sick, this one might die. I don't, I don't know, just throwing that out there. A lot of people like to bring stuff like that to my attention. And uh, so they're going to worship this beast. In verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I only know of one religion in the world that worships images. It's that one right there. Yep. Just saying. 16, and he calls it all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So you got the mark of the beast coming, and it's something in your right hand. And then you got the COVID passport thing, and it's ultimately leading to something that you put in your right hand. Is there a connection there? No. I don't know. I don't know. So why is the Pope pushing this? Why is this digital quantum tattoo coming out? Why are so many people that are trained by Jesuits behind all this? Another good question. Let's close with 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So I haven't put anybody down today, have I? I haven't attacked or ridiculed or made fun of anything like that. I'm just telling you that this is what I am. I'm a Christian. And this is what they are and what they believe. And I choose to side with the Bible over tradition. Does that make me a bad guy? Well, if so, all right, cut my head off. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. That, that's what they're going to plan to do anyway. So, But I won't be here. I hope to be raptured first. But... Um, you see how I'm not the enemy? I'm just a level-headed guy that says, hey, let's examine this and see what the Bible says. That's all we're doing. Just trying to see where it lines up with the Bible. So it says uh, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 17, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. See, I'm not worshiping an idol in a man-built temple. The Bible says, I am the temple of God. So what I put in my body is my decision. And if it's against my conscience, I can't take it. I can't take the mass. And I will not take whatever else those people try to say that I have to put in me. Because that goes against my conscience. And this is my temple, and I'm not letting it in. Okay? And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So I'm supposed to be separate. So I don't want to be a part of that. So I don't celebrate the Mass. I actually don't celebrate anything those people do in that religion. Because as a Christian, I look at it and I go, I don't think that's Christian. I think that's a false Christianity, and I just don't want to have any part of it. Um, what's that? North, the dog. Oh, to the dog. <laughs> Amen. So 
We'll close there, but I, I did all this for several reasons. I'd like to start here soon in Sunday school talking about church history Amen. and a little bit about the history of Baptists versus Protestants. We're a Baptist church. You know what Catholics say? Well, you're just a Protestant. Actually, no. no. Did you know that the Baptists were never Protestants? Right. Protestants came out of the Roman religion. Baptists were never in it. They've always, since the time of Paul, and even before, said, no, we're not going to go over to this side. We're going to stay here. So I think it is worth looking into that. I'd like to talk about freedom of conscience. Because Baptists have always said, look, we believe in the right to freely associate with who we choose to associate and freely decide for ourselves and not go against our own conscience. And things like that. So I want to look into that, um, freedom of conscience and things like that. I recently got a, a couple of books that I've been reading, and it's called Man Maidenburg, Germany. Have you ever heard of Maidenburg, Germany? Well, you will. <laughs> because there were some Baptists in Maidenburg, Germany that took a stand for what they believed. And if it hadn't been for them, we'd probably be all Roman Catholics right now. And you've probably never even heard of them. So when we get into this, that'll be several weeks off or whatever. I want you to see that. Did you know the United States of America was founded with all the freedoms we have because of the Baptists? That's in Bill Grady's book and a lot of other sources. They said, we don't accept this Constitution unless you put down some things in there about our conscience that we have freely rights, God-given rights. And that's when they said, okay, and they wrote the Bill of Rights. And then all over America and most of the colonies, Baptist preachers go, well, all right. <laughs> they were the holdouts. So it's just amazing to look into all this. Now, I'm not going to heaven because I'm a Baptist. Amen. Right. I don't believe that Baptists will get you to heaven. But I do believe that it's, it's good to look at these things. And I love history and I will look at history. And we started with the verse, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So I tried to prove to you what the Bible says. Now it's up to you to read and study and decide which side you want to be on. Do you all want to go to the Mass tonight <laughs> with me at the Catholic Church? I don't. I'm not going because I don't believe in that. But what do we believe in? That we can freely assemble as saved people and read the Bible and study. And we don't need a man to govern us. God governs us. Amen. Now, of course, he'll put a pastor. They'll help us. But we worship God. Yes. We don't worship a man that says, hey, call me your God, your Holy Father. Okay. All right. We'll stop there. Thank you for watching. Anyone have anything? We, any questions or anything? Go ahead. What about the sacrament? So in Baptist churches, they have two things that they call ordinances. A sacrament is the Catholic church. And so those are two things they call ordinances. And I can't wait to look at those because I think some Baptists practice it a little different than it was in the early church. I want to talk to you about that too. Um, I don't think that God wants us to go to church and have a little glass of wine with one gulp and one little chicle. And that's the Lord's Supper. I've never thought that. I've always thought that's, that seems weird to me. I've always thought that the Lord's Supper is just like Jesus eating with the others at a table, like we do here when we have the Lord's Supper. That's always been to me what the Lord's Supper is. But when you try to make something into a ritual, you kind of mess it up. So I'll talk about that. We can do what we want with that. And uh, it, as far as I'm concerned, being saved and knowing you're saved is first and foremost. Then all this other stuff is things we learn and we get a hold of. But we should never brag about what our denomination is. We should brag on Jesus. Yes. But it's not wrong to be a certain denomination, especially today when a lot of places don't even count you as a Christian unless you tell them, well, what denomination are you from? You know what I mean? And if, if you say anything other than Catholic, they go, well, Catholic's the oldest, so you're not a recognized. Mm. What do you mean I'm not a recognized? Do you realize I'm going to teach you that Baptists are older than Catholics? Mm -hmm. They really are. And because they go with Paul and they come from the apostles and Paul. So they're actually pre-Catholicism. So... They do not come from John the Baptist, though. That's a Baptist brighter. And that's another thing we need to talk about is how there's Baptist brighters and Baptists that go too far with it, that don't rightly divide. Right. So I don't want to be that. But I don't mind saying I'm a Baptist because I know that Baptists have, throughout the centuries, tried to stick with the Bible. Now, some of them were bad, but some of them were good. And I just want to be that kind of person that stands for truth. And they're the only example we have in this world of those that took a stand for the truth. And so, amen for that. Anybody else? We've got to stop, I guess. Okay, we'll stop there and look forward to next week. Amen.